Um, basically, we have hundreds of millions of people worldwide who are spending 20 plus hours a week playing their favorite games. Um, so they're creating this kind of collective resource of mind share, heart share, energy. Um, and if we can figure out how to tap that participation bandwidth to kind of siphon off some of that gaming time, hundreds of millions of people spending 20 hours or more a week playing video games, uh, we can do a lot of good things. So um, why is this happening? Why are there so many people, such diverse kinds of people, playing games and, you know, so hundreds of millions of people playing 20 hours or more a week? That's, that's like a half, that's like a half-time job. Um, why is this happening? Um, and more importantly, how can museums harness the rising power of games for good? We know that this participation bandwidth is out there. We know that more and more people are becoming uh, adept at playing games. What can we do with that that is good for the world? Um, so let's tackle the why question. Why is this happening? Um, in a nutshell, games make us happy, and games help us do things that are more amazing than we think we're capable of doing in our real lives without games. So I'm going to talk about these two things, why games make us happy and how games convince us that we're superheroes, um, and then talk about how we can apply that to real-world things. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with something called positive psychology, or the new science of happiness. That's something that's been developing over the past decade as an alternative to psychology that looks at our mental illness and, and chronic problems. Um, we want to know what is optimal human experience and what can we do to increase satisfaction and well-being. Um, these are some of the best sellers that I recommend um, everybody in the experience business should read. Um, and what's happening is that it's not just academic books and academic research, although there's a lot of that. It's really becoming a popular trend. A lot of people um, are quite familiar with this now. These are some sort of mainstream coverage. Um, and we're seeing lots of institutions, government agencies, trying to apply the science of happiness in a way that, that provides rigorous metrics so we can see what the impact of our policies are, or the impact of our built environments are on people's happiness. They're creating happiness maps and happiness metrics. So these are just a few of my favorites, um, like Gross National Happiness um, is a great one, um, and uh, the Authentic Happiness Inventory, where you can just take an inventory of your own personal life and figure out what you're doing in your life that's making you actually happier and what you're doing that's not. Um, and there's some great sort of web 2.0 sites where they're trying to give people the power to use this happiness science. Um, so happier.com is in beta right now, and they're just really going to use the science to help you chart your happiness and, and get happier. And so there's just interesting stuff to see. And then, of course, there's a backlash because with any big movement, you have um, people who are against the movement. So we have against happiness. Um, <laughs> Which is a great book, actually, because it turns out that what this author is against um, is old-school notions of happiness, this idea that happiness is a warm puppy, and it's going to be warm and fuzzy, and we're just going to be all happy all the time, and it's, it's kind of very bland and mushy and not that interesting. So happiness is not a warm puppy. That is not what the science of happiness is about. Science of happiness is about understanding what the human brain is built for, what our emotional systems are built for, our social systems are built for, so that we can optimize human experience in a way that basically matches up with how we've evolved um, as, as human beings. Um, so I have been just immersed in this research for years, um, and uh, I have boiled it down to four things that seem to appear across all the literature. Now, there are different kinds of happiness in different um, demographics. Things matter more or less as you age. Um, and also in different countries, we see some, some differences. But there are four things that seem to be pretty universal. So here they are. Uh, first, satisfying work to do. Kind of waking up in the morning with a concrete task. Something that you know you are meant to do and you can know at the end of the day whether you did it or not. Um, it's a very concrete, specific things to do. Um, the second is the experience of being good at something. Uh, we don't have to be rich or famous, um, but we do have to feel like we have some strength that we can apply and that the rest of the world can see that we've contributed. We've made a contribution. We were good at something. Um, all of us require time spent with people we like, even if we're introverted. I'm extremely introverted, but around the people that we like, we do draw energy from that. And so it's important that people have social interaction, that that's, we're social creatures. Um, and finally, the chance to be a part of something bigger. Um, we all crave meaning that extends beyond our own personal life, um, to see that there is a bigger picture. And since some people seek this through science. Some people seek it through religion or art or activism. 
Um, and, and so there are lots of ways we can become a part of something bigger, um, even our genealogies. But these are the four things that human beings need to be fully engaged with reality. And if we have these four things, it really doesn't matter what else is happening in our lives. Um, all the research shows, whether it's health or money, if we have these four things, um, we're, we're extremely happy people. Now, um, if we look at museums briefly, because what, what I want to do here is look at the opportunity for museums to make people happy. Um, and I'm going to make an argument soon as to why I think museums should be in the business of making people happy. Um, but if we look at what museums are doing now, um, just to sort of get the seed in your head, I would argue that museums are built to do the latter two of these things. They are a place to spend time with people we like. We see families going, people go with their friends or on dates. Um, and you do get to be around strangers. It would be nice if we had a chance to maybe spend time with the strangers as well. Um, and I'll get back to that. And then the chance to be a part of something bigger. Well, museums are always telling a big story, right? That's what the collections do. They situate you in a history or in a community. Um, so that does seem to be a natural fit. But in terms of satisfying work to do or the experience of being good at something, I would say that um, very few museums give me something to do, a concrete goal or mission when I get there. Um, and they don't give me the experience of being good at something. In fact, oftentimes they might make me feel dumb. Um, it's true. <laughs> um, so this is something that I think about. We'll come back to it. Um, but you know, what would it, what would it mean if if we could optimize museums to give the four things that human beings crave? Um, you know, why would it matter that museums have the potential to really do these four things in a way that other institutions might not? Um, what I think is that museums are a leading candidate to be kind of pioneers in the sustainable happiness movement. Um, one of the reasons why I think this is that museums have been uh, really optimized for collective experience. So really our premier platform for collective experience. When we think about global happiness, um, well-being and satisfaction, we're really talking about being with other people and finding meaning in something bigger than ourselves. And so museums are poised to really deliver this to the world. Uh, if we can figure out how to do the first two things, sort of satisfying work and this feeling of being good at something. Um, right, so that's what I want us to do. I want us to fix the top two parts. Um, in order to do this, I think what the, the museum community needs is something I call happiness engineers. People who can take the theory of the science of happiness and then apply it, develop the systems. What are the systems we need to build? Um, and, and here's a good way of thinking about it. Um, John Mason Good once said, happiness consists in activity. It's a running stream, not a stagnant pool. So we need people who can create activities that generate happiness. 